Tonight, we continue our 15 part series on the first 100 days of the Donald Trump administration with a look at how the new president will affect the judiciary in general and the Supreme Court in particular. We start off by meeting the young person at the center of one of the high court's biggest cases this term. I'm a normal kid. Um, I'm not out, I don't have an agenda other than using the bathroom. Gavin Grimm, a 17-year-old from a quiet town in Virginia, is the student at the center of one of the Supreme Court's most highly anticipated cases of the term. Born a biological female, the high school senior now identifies as male and wants the ability to use male-designated restrooms at Gloucester High School, which would violate school board policy. People who are transgender are not looking for special rights. They're not looking for any special treatment. We're just looking for equal treatment. Gavin's case is one of many transgender legal challenges scattered around the country, winding their way through the court system. Just outside Chicago, a group of parents is fighting back against what they call an invasion of their children's privacy, saying they shouldn't be exposed to students of the opposite biological sex in school facilities. Some students have resorted to wearing their gym clothes underneath their school clothes so they don't have to disrobe in school locker rooms. This issue I don't think is a Democrat or Republican issue. There are many people in our community. We may be on different sides and you know, politically, but we can all agree that this, uh, this is just gone, this is a bridge way too far, and that we need to protect the minor children in our schools. The case the Supreme Court has agreed to hear in the spring, regardless of whether it has eight justices or nine, centers on whether the federal government has the right to dictate to local school districts how they navigate the issue. It's just one of many hot-button topics likely to be impacted by the hundreds of federal judges President-elect Donald Trump will nominate, starting at the top with the Supreme Court seat left open by the sudden death of Justice Antonin Scalia. Mr. Trump has released two lists for a total of 21 possible high court nominees, which he has pledged not to deviate from for his first Supreme Court pick. Only from that list I'm going to pick. Only. We're not going outside that list. Religious right voters who helped put Trump over the top say they expect him to deliver on his promise to appoint a staunch conservative in the mold of Scalia. All the evangelicals who voted him because of the issue of judges and the Supreme Court are going to be looking uh, with laser focus on this appointment to the Supreme Court. Front runners include federal appellate court judges Thomas Hardiman, who authored an opinion finding that the Fourth Amendment ban on unreasonable searches and seizures was not violated by prison officials who strip searched all arrestees, a finding that was upheld by the Supreme Court. Raymond Kesslidge, from the bench, he's both blasted the EEOC and ordered the IRS to turn over lists of Tea Party members who'd been targeted. Bill Pryor, who has harshly criticized Roe v. Wade and made it to the bench only after initially being filibustered by Senate Democrats. And Diane Sykes, like Hardiman, Kethledge and Pryor, she was appointed by President George W. Bush and has notable opinions in favor of voter ID and gun rights. As the politics of the next Supreme Court pick rage on, most Americans admit they've got a rather abstract view of the Supreme Court and the cases it hears. But many of them start in towns like this one, a friendly community at a local high school facing a very controversial issue. For now, Gavin waits along with advocates on both sides of the debate to see whom Mr. Trump nominates and how it could impact landmark cases like this one. I have immense confidence in our judicial system um, and in the ability of justices of whatever background to look at the facts of the case and to understand the principles that animate our civil rights laws um, and to come to a good decision. I think any justice looking at that would reach the conclusion schools have a duty to protect privacy and dignity and the federal government has no business telling local schools what they must do with their showers, locker rooms, and restrooms. It's a legal debate that will almost certainly not be resolved before Gavin graduates. My high school experience has been frankly ruined by this situation, but my main concern more than anything else is that I want to set a positive precedent for people that will come after me. Despite suggestions to the contrary, sources tell me Trump's unlikely to nominate a potential justice before Election Day because until he's sworn in, he cannot launch the FBI background checks on his Supreme Court finalists. It is possible, though, given his unconventional way of doing things. Tomorrow, we continue our series with a look at the expected actions from the Trump administration to end illegal immigration. Mm -hmm.
We are just two hours away from President-elect Donald Trump's second stop of his post-election thank you tour, this time in Fayetteville, North Carolina. You never know what he might say, so stay tuned. Remember the big news he revealed during his rally in Cincinnati last week. I don't want to tell you this because I want to save the suspense. We are going to appoint Mad Dog Matter as our Secretary of Defense. Keep it inside the room, but that's what we have, and he's our best. They say he's the closest thing to General George Patton that we have, and it's about time. It's about time. Retired Marine General James Mattis will be joining the president-elect tonight and will formally be announced as Mr. Trump's pick for Secretary of Defense. That's according to the transition team. And Kimberly, earlier today I talked to some Senate staffers who said they believe that the waiver that is necessary for him to be able to, to get the confirmation because uh, it's not been seven years seven since years, his right. um, retirement, that they think that's going to be able to sail through no problem. Well, I hope so because uh, we need it to sail through. I think this is an excellent choice. I'm really looking forward to it. This is a name that was kind of bandied about before as a potential vice presidential pick as well. A lot of people in the military have tremendous uh, respect for him. He's got a cool nickname, Mad Dog. We share that in common. And uh, so I'm excited. I know I'm Mad Dog and my boy is Road Dog. Isn't that funny? <laughs> yes, one of my brother calls me. He doesn't even call me Kim, whatever. He calls me Mad Dog. Is there a reason that we got the nickname? No, like tough, cool. I like yeah. it. I like Get it Julie, done. do you agree that then? Um, with fighting? Undef no, undefeated in sports. Do you think the Democrats will enemies? go ahead and support the waiver? Uh, I think some will. I think some have already said they won't. I, I hope they do. Um, this is not a fight that I think they should pick. I, th pick. I think he's a reasonable choice. Yeah. Um, typically, the president does get his choice of nominees, um, except for extreme cases, and I can think of a few extreme cases that where I wouldn't mm -hmm. support the nominee, but this is not one that, that I think they should oppose. I understand you have um, the senator here from New York, Kirsten Gillibrand, saying she's not going to mm -hmm. do that, and a few others in the House, but the reality is... Uh, not that many. Not that many, and I think they should. Um, do you think that he'll announce any other thing, any other I'm nominees hoping, tonight? I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping John Huntsman gets named as Secretary of State. <laughs> He's obviously not going to do it. I think it. you've got a man crush. Oh my God. Since Jeff, you're going you? crazy. I mean, so, look, I, I, like I had this brainstorm a couple of weeks ago, and then it, it, and it turns out Huntsman talked to him the other day about possibly becoming the Secretary of State. And the more I think about it, the more, I, and I've looked into Huntsman's past. I've known him, his family has been in business, has been in the oil business, has been in the natural gas business, in the chemicals business. For years, for decades, um, they have a massive uh, cancer center out in Utah. But John Huntsman's a two time governor, elected twice to probably one of the redder states and in the country. To China. Ambassador mm -hmm. to China speaks Mandarin, guy knows business, guy knows the world. I, I absolutely love this choice. And credit as, for, as for I, yeah, that brainstorm? No, no, because I didn't tell anyone. Oh. I told some friends at dinner, but I just think that I'm just so happy when There's those a mind melt. Are. How's this? I know, that, I know the campaign, the transition team watches this show. I'm just putting in my, my, war, my two cents that this would be an absolutely great pick. He's the, he's the, he brings everything that Romney would have brought, but without the never Trump part of the, of the Romney you got, Do you have any comment on General Mattis and the Department of Defense before we move on? Uh, obviously, he should get the waiver, but forget about the waiver. They should change this law. It's from, I guess, 1947. It was 10 years, and they changed it to seven years because they realized, I think they realized there was something wrong with the, with the law. Uh, I think that the military is different now. The idea that you have to be out of uniform for seven years, it seems like a crazy law. I mean, wh what is the reason for it? The idea that you want to be off the battlefield? I mean, civilian control of the military has long been, I mean, that's the Seven years, principle. it seems a little long to me. I think they should change the law. All right. Let's move on to something else because we had President Obama today who was speaking uh, about national security. And he's repeatedly claimed that al-Qaeda's Leadership has been destroyed, but ISIS is waving victory flags in some places in the world. He did so again during his counterterrorism address at Medill Air Force Base in Tampa just moments ago. For Al-Qaeda, the organization that hit us on 9-11, is a shadow of its former self. Its leadership has been decimated. The terrorist threat was never restricted to South Asia or to Afghanistan or Pakistan. Even as al-Qaeda has been decimated in Afghanistan and Pakistan, the threat from terrorists metastasized in other parts of the Middle East. And most dangerously, we saw the emergence of ISIL, the successor to al-Qaeda in Iraq. To say that we made progress is not to say that the job is done. We know that a deadly threat persists. The president also warns against aggressive interrogation techniques, including waterboarding. Staying true to our traditions, 
as a nation of laws advances our security as well as our values. We prohibited torture everywhere at all times, and that includes tactics like waterboarding. And at no time has anybody who has worked with me told me that doing so has cost us good intelligence. Despite all the political rhetoric about the need to strip terrorists of their rights, our interrogation teams have obtained valuable information from terrorists without resorting to torture. Kim, this is probably one of his last addresses that he'll give on national security, and he's just going over some of that well-trod ground on waterboarding and trying to make... I actually think that he was trying to say, obviously, we didn't contain the terrorist threat because now you have ISIS to contend with. Right. Okay. So, you know, President Obama was really not a big fan of the killer capture. He kind of loves the killing, to be honest with you, because he's the one that has ordered all these predator drone strikes. No, he's not in favor of waterboarding not keeping them alive, but the problem is when you don't utilize effective intelligence gathering techniques, you are then wasting an opportunity to be able to get intel and collect it to prevent future attacks. If you're just killing an information-rich source target like that, it dies with them. So you're not able then to continue forward to get other associates, other people that are working with them, other, you know, um, predictors about future terrorist attacks, and that, that's a problem. So we've actually lost, and if you talk to any of the intelligence officers, a lot of opportunities to be able to get that information. So I think they really need to take a focus back on that and you'll see that with uh, General Flynn and General Mattis, I believe, in terms of advising him about that to get back in the intelligence game. Because, Eric, that is interesting because um, in 2013, President Obama gave speeches saying Al Qaeda is decimated, we're moving on, and that because that vacuum left in Iraq, you deal with ISIS, which is then metastasizing around the region. And, and what he failed to mention that what happens is, and these, these, these killers, these Islamic extremists, which he fails, he won't say, went from the Taliban to Al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. from Al-Qaeda now to ISIS, and if you start to make some way into, uh, into ISIS, they'll metastasize into something else in another region where you take your eye off the ball. It's very interesting to me, though, that, um, you know, President Obama, he's, he's against waterboarding, we know that, although he'll take the victory lap on, catch, on killing bin Laden, even though the intelligence came from a waterboarding session that led to the courier that, that, that got, eventually got bin Laden. That's a good point. But he's more, more concerned with releasing these Gitmo terrorists than getting information out of them. It just blows my mind, and he wonders why they go from Taliban to al-Qaeda to ISIS. You mm -hmm. have to get the intel. You have to do what it takes to get the intel and then kill them, call them what they are. A very interesting side note. General Mattis against waterboarding. Well, I think that's interesting, Julie, is one of the things that Donald Trump has said, um, and I think Michael Flynn as well, um, that why do we keep announcing what we would do or not do? Just say we are a nation of laws. I, do, I believe that everything that was done in the Bush administration was lawful. But do you think that um, maybe there will be a different way to address terrorism and giving what Kimberly was saying is not just kill? but maybe kill and ca uh, capture so that we can get the intel? Um, maybe, but first and foremost, yes, General Mattis is now against, or was, has always been against waterboarding. Apparently Donald Trump, after a conversation with him, a brief conversation with him, is now also against waterboarding, he announced um, at Bedminster a couple of weeks ago when he met with him. But what I think is fascinating is, you know, Kimberly has a point about capturing these people and getting information from them, whether through waterboarding but there's other or hopefully, gathering or, or, right, or hopefully other means. What's interesting to yeah. me, though, is you have to, put boots on the ground in order to do that. It's a lot easier to kill them from a drone and not put our soldiers in harm's way and on the ground. Yeah. So we have to have an honest discussion. I've said this from day one. If we want to do that, we have to have an honest discussion with the American people. This will involve having many more troops on the ground in order to capture these people because a drone can't capture them. And that's a discussion that I think President Obama, frankly, has been loath to have. And, and I think to some extent, uh, President-elect Trump has also been loath to have. It's, a, it's an honest discussion we need to have about the appetite that people in this country may or may not have for putting more boots on the ground all over Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and now more and more potentially in places like Europe. That's not the from. intelligence gathering uh, faction. I mean, what you're going to do, you're going to have CIA officers, you're going to have uh, special forces, special operators, SEALs. But uh, green them. They are there already. They're all there. They're all there. They're there right now. 
But I'm not sure to the extent that so you're what talking are you about killing them. Drill? So you're going to capture these killers on the it's battlefield, like you're the bring back troops. to Gitmo, and then do what? You interrogate them. No, I just don't but, think... but they don't want to do. So but... maybe Mattis has a different idea. Maybe Mattis I'm... will come in and say, "All right, so we'll capture them. We'll bring them back to Gitmo. We won't close Gitmo, and we will enhance interrogate them." Okay, you don't want to waterboard them. There are many other methods other of, of enhanced Listen, interrogation. That's fine. As long as you don't torture, I'm fine with that. But there's other ways to do it. And apparently, Mattis doesn't believe that you need to torture somebody to get information out of them. Trump. I feel like you could define torture. Anyway, right? I think water um, one thing you didn't clear. talk about today were any of the attacks such as Fort Hood, Chattanooga, San Bernardino, yes. Orlando. And the reason that we talk that we talk about waterboarding so much is because it is right on the line. Because you talk about defining torture, we don't torture, but right on the line was waterboarding. It's the most talked about thing. And how often did we do it? A couple of times, and we will not shut up about waterboarding. No one's going to do it. I mean, it's it off the worked. table. It's off the it table, worked. basically. But I mean, everyone. And we do it now. It's become we a way. We do it to our own trip. Hold There's on, been more listen, U.S. Would... soldiers and special forces guys and operators waterboarded than any of the enemy. You get that? Because in order to even be in exactly. those groups, it's part of the training. I'm with you, Kimberly. That's why. I mean, it's either do it or not. But we've talked why about so, it. Why so talk much. about it? It's a way to signal. You know, I'm. We're against torture. Yeah. So I'm against waterboarding. I mean. Uh, President Obama has never waterboarded, but he's never stopped talking about how he won't waterboard. It's which is, ridiculous. Which is torturing us in a whole <laughs> other way. And there's other enhanced interrogation techniques that are so frightening, like caterpillars on shoulders if they're afraid of bugs. Loud music. Loud Sleep music. Deprivation. Yeah, I mean, it's a finger God forbid the open hand slap. I mean, that's that just awful. There's right. to the people, who, the, these people who are blowing up and killing Americans everywhere they can find one, or Westerners. Even though Republicans control both houses of Congress, that doesn't mean lawmakers will be a rubber stamp for the new Republican president. In fact, some might be extremely difficult. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel has that story tonight from Capitol Hill. The Trump administration agenda is already facing some resistance on Capitol Hill, even with Vice President-elect Pence starting discussions here. The president-elect floated the idea of a 35 percent tariff for companies that move jobs out of the country. Yet top House Republicans have dodged questions about it. What the president-elect is talking about is how do we create more jobs here. The first way we do that is with tax reform. It's consistent with our goal to make American businesses and American products more competitive in the global economy. And we believe the best way to achieve that goal is through comprehensive tax reform. A top priority for the Trump administration and lawmakers is repealing and replacing Obamacare. Republican leaders suggest there could be a transition period of up to three years from the Affordable Care Act to a new health care system to make sure 20 million Americans Americans don't lose coverage and to allow the insurance industry to adjust. But the new leader of the House Freedom Caucus says that's not good enough. The repeal and the replacement, I think, needs to come together and be in, a, in no more than two years as we look at it. Then there's the resistance coming from Democrats. The new Trump administration cabinet will need to be confirmed by the Senate. But already the minority party is threatening to slow walk the president elect's nominees, giving them the so called Garland treatment after the GOP refused to consider Supreme Court nominee Merrick Garland. For any of these nominees, I think the watchword is a thorough, thorough vetting. Don't say absolutely not, but they have to answer and satisfy the American people about a whole lot of questions. Today, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell told reporters thanks to Democrats changing the Senate rules in 2013 from a 60 vote threshold to 51 votes, there isn't much the minority party can do. There are some advantages to being in the majority, uh, particularly with a 51 vote threshold for confirmations of most executive branch opponent, uh, uh, appointments, and we certainly intend to take advantage of it. McConnell announced the Obamacare repeal resolution will be the first item up in the new year. I'm told the replacement won't be another 2,000 page bill. It'll be a series of steps over a period of time. Shannon? All right, ones that folks may actually be able to read before they vote on. Uh, Mike Emanuel on the Hill, thank you. Thank you. And as you just heard, Trump says Boeing is, in his words, doing a little bit of a number on the airplane contract. Correspondent Doug McElway looks into the deal and whether or not Trump can really stop it. 
To replace the aging Air Force One, the last two series Boeing 747 in operation in the U.S., the Air Force signed a single bid contract with Boeing earlier this year for three new 747-8 series to be ready by the year 2024, later reduced to just two planes. But the president-elect threw the agreement into doubt this morning when he fired another warning shot across the bow of an American company, threatening to cancel the contract because of what Trump alleged were cost overruns. It's going to be over $4 billion it's for Air Force One program, and uh, I think it's ridiculous. At today's opening bell, Boeing stock dove 1.6 percent before climbing back. Boeing responded after Trump's comment that it's in the early stages of designing the new planes and has only spent $170 million thus far. The Air Force told Fox News it's budgeted $2.7 billion in 2017, but, quote, expect this number to change as the program matures. Critics of Pentagon procurement noted the new Marine One helicopter fleet, first announced in the Obama administration's infancy, was also grossly over budget. Your helicopter is now going to cost as much as Air Force One. The helicopter I have now seems perfectly adequate to me. Um, of course, I've never had a helicopter before. So. The Obama administration canceled the program to replace the fleet after the projected cost more than doubled. One expert suggests there's a common thread in cost overruns. What I believe is driving Air Force One, the 747, is requirements that are far too excessive. And, and that's where they have to get a handle on it. Observers say Trump's remarks were clearly designed to send a signal to the Pentagon about its bloated procurement process. If the president-elect's intent is to say we need to reform how the Pentagon does business, then he's absolutely right. But Trump may also have been reasserting a campaign theme, again urging big U.S. manufacturers to stay put. Boeing and Lockheed Martin have recently proposed plans to build F-18 and F-16 fighters in India. Both companies argue it will not not lead to a job loss in the U.S. Trump's remarks today may have been inspired by a recent speech by Boeing CEO Dennis Mullenberg to an Illinois manufacturing group last Friday, where he said the U.S. needs to take a leading role in shaping trade agreements. He said, quote, because if we do not lead when it comes to writing these rules, our competitors will write them for us. Shannon? Doug McElway, thank you very much. Well, we begin with senior national correspondent John Roberts in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where Trump will be speaking at the top of the hour. Good evening, John. Uh, good evening to you, Shannon, North Carolina, where Donald Trump won by about four points. And, of course, the big news here tonight is Donald Trump will be introducing to the nation his pick for Secretary of Defense, General James Mad Dog Mattis. Donald Trump figured that with Fort Bragg just about eight miles down the road, Fayetteville would be the perfect place to do that. In the meantime, there was plenty of other news being made at the Trump transition headquarters. Twice today, Donald Trump made a surprise visit to the lobby of Trump Tower, once with Japanese technology investor Masayoshi Son, to announce that the two had agreed to a deal to create thousands of American jobs. This is Masa of SoftBank from Japan, and he's just agreed to invest $50 billion in the United States and 50,000 jobs. While there were few details of the agreement, Sun has been putting together a $100 billion technology fund and is looking to make a big investment in startup companies here if the regulatory environment is favorable. Trump's other surprise appearance in the lobby today may actually cost American jobs. The Air Force is contracted with Boeing to replace the aging Air Force One 747s. But when Trump discovered the price tag, he blew up on Twitter today, writing, quote, Boeing is building a brand new 747 Air Force One for future presidents, but costs are out of control. More than $4 billion. Cancel order. The president-elect suggested Boeing is playing fast and loose with military budgets. I think Boeing is doing a little bit of a number. We want Boeing to make a lot of money, but not that much money. Okay, thank you. Trump today continued his search for a secretary of state, meeting with Exxon Mobil CEO Rex Tillerson, the first time he has broadened his horizon outside the world of politics and military for secretary of state. His vice president-elect insists Trump is simply looking for the best person for the job. He's going to listen to, on an ongoing basis, a broad range of counselors, a broad range of candidates, and I'm very confident sure. he's going to choose a secretary of state that's going to be able to carry the Trump agenda, putting America first, right. onto the world stage. As the president-elect continues his quest for a top diplomat, questions continue over why Trump took a phone call from Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen last week. Chinese officials complained the call broke decades of 
have diplomatic protocol. But Governor Pence today said Trump felt it would have been rude to not take size call. This was a congratulatory call and it was a courtesy. Uh, the president-elect was uh, fully aware of uh, the one China policy. He's also very aware that the United States has, uh, has sold billions of dollars in arms uh, to Taiwan. Trump's choice of ambassador to China will be an important one. We had a wonderful meeting. Sources say Trump is all but settled on Iowa Governor Terry Branstad, the nation's longest serving governor whose state has a long history of trade and agriculture with China. And uh, Branstad is also very close friends with Chinese President Xi Jinping, so that could help keep the lines of communication open, even if the two leaders don't necessarily agree with each other. At the same time, uh, Donald Trump's uh, pick for Secretary of Defense is running into some headwinds on Capitol Hill. Because General Mattis has only been under the military for three years, he requires special permission from Congress to serve in the civilian position there at the Pentagon. Republicans in Congress are thinking of putting a measure into this week's budget bill that would help expedite the process to get him a waiver and get him through confirmation. But today, the House Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi said she is firmly opposed to anything that would give Mattis a less than full consideration by Congress. Shannon? Yeah, John Roberts, thank you very much. We're going to talk about that with the panel coming up.